Hello, and welcome to Grace Bible Church Sermon Audio Podcast. Grace Bible is a non-denominational Bible teaching church located in Rockwell, North Carolina. Our motto is relationship, not religion. At Grace, we emphasize the peace found only through a relationship with our Savior, Jesus Christ, which is based upon personal faith in Him, not based on our religious performance. We appreciate you joining us and trust that you are encouraged today by the teaching as our pastors give practical application of principles from God's Word. All right, well this morning I'd like to take a look at Romans chapter 14. And for lack of a better title, I decided to call this Gray Areas. Um, Wasn't really sure what to title this, so if you don't find that title helpful, just chuck it. Um, I started to call this questionable areas, and then I realized, eh, questionable is maybe not the right word to use, so I'm going to go with gray areas. Um, And so what this is all about this morning is, um, you know, Paul has really gone through the book of Romans, and he's covered a lot of ground. I mean, he's covered everything from soup to nuts. I mean, just everything from man's lost condition, how to be saved, um, salvation is by faith alone, and Jesus and he's, he's gone on, he's given us the three therefore statements. Um, and, and so then now starting in chapter 12, he's really given us guidance on how to successfully navigate this race that we're all in, which is the, it's called the Christian life. So for those of us who are believers, you know, we're in this, um, I don't want to call it an event, but it's, it's, it's like a race. Paul likens it to a race. And we're on this race, we're on it together with other believers. And, and as such, we need to pay attention to how we run the race. And Paul says that you know, many, many things are, are just are cut and dried. I mean, the Scripture just tells us um, you know, how we're to navigate those, those areas. Uh, but then there are some what we want to call gray areas. They're things where the Scripture just doesn't give us um, super clear um, guidance. And, and what I mean by that, Scripture gives us plenty of guidance. Okay? Um, scripture gives us what we need. Okay, but it sometimes doesn't get as specific as we would like for it to. It just doesn't really tell us, um, you know, hey, you, today, you need to do X, Y, and Z, and not A, B, and C. So we, you know, we look to the scripture, sometimes we want it just spelled out really neatly for us, and instead what it gives us is a principle to live by. Um, and it gives us, uh, you know, examples, it gives us pictures, uh, but it's up to us to apply that to our lives. And so some of these areas come up, we're going to call them gray areas. And so as we go through this, um, obviously we're looking at it, we're trying to answer questions as we go through, but I'm afraid as we go through today, I might leave you with more questions than, than you had when you came in. Uh, and that's not a bad thing if they're the right questions. So, um, th- th- so I want to start with a question. Uh, when we talk about gray areas, um, the question that really I, sh- I should be asking in, in light of what we've read so far, okay, is, how do I love God and, and serve others? How, how do I do that? So we're not asking, should, should we serve God and love others? Chapter 12 has already dealt with that. Paul says, it's your reasonable service. He said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves as a living sacrifice. It, it logically follows that we should do these things. doesn't mean that we all will, but it, it means that we should. So the question is not should we, it's how do we do it? How do we navigate this thing called the Christian life? How do we love God, practically speaking, with our choices that we make, with what we accept into our lives and how we treat others? How do we do that? And, and um, so I think, you know, there's some scriptural princ- principles that will come up today that I think will be useful for us as we navigate this question. Um, and so, you know, how do I love God and serve others? Um, you know, that can play out in, you know, how do we decide what we accept is uh, okay and not okay in our lives? Uh, how, do we, how do we treat others who, who are believers who maybe have a different viewpoint? That's, that's going to be uh, in there, too, as we talk this morning. Um, you know, primarily, what's in view here, um, Paul's going to start in chapter 14 and verses 1 through 4 and talk about this issue that came up uh, between believers in the early church where they were torn about whether or not they could eat uh, meat. And you say, well, I didn't realize that was an issue. Okay, well, it was an issue. Um, and the reason it was an issue back then was uh, because in that day and time, they had, um, it was the Roman Empire, they had pagan uh, temples of worship everywhere, and they would sacrifice animals in those temples. 
Um, and so as not to waste those animals, they would take those animals and they would put them up for sale in the marketplaces and people would, you know, they'd buy meat, take it home and, you know, and eat and so forth. And, and the question came up is, is it okay to, to eat that? Because it's, it's been sacrificed to an idol and, and there were people who felt that, um, you know, if I eat that, that I'm somehow participating in that that I'm enabling that to go on. And, and they, they did not have a clear conscience about it. And as such, then they avoided the whole topic of meat by simply saying, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to eat vegetables, and that way I don't even accidentally you know, eat this thing that could have been sacrificed to an idol. Um, and, then the, and then there was sort of this other camp where you know, folks that, like Paul would say, I'm, I'm convinced that there is nothing that is unclean. Now, not everything is helpful, he said, but I'm convinced that there's nothing unclean of itself. And, and so Paul, for, for one, he had no uh, qualms about eating just whatever was, you know, was served to him, whether it was meat or, or whatever. Um, but, this, but this was an issue that caused some believers to violate their conscience. And so Paul says, what do we do in this situation? It's a gray area. I mean, what do we do? Do we just like not, like all of us not eat meat? Or, you know, do, you know what do we do here? And so he gives us some instructions and some um, some guidance as how to avoid pitfalls in that situation. And as we read today, you know, this is, this is first century Christianity. You know, this is what they were dealing with, you know, real life at that time. Uh, today, I don't think we really deal with the same issue, but we deal with lots of similar types of issues. So think about things today, issues on which uh, c- Christians, believers who are, who are committed to walking with the Lord, who are, who are really desiring to walk uh, with Him. They're, they're wanting to you know, walk with the Holy Spirit. They're wanting to, to run the race without disqualifying themselves. You know, think about issues on which Christians disagree. I mean, and, and it could be anything from, um, and we'll talk about some of these this morning. It's, it's not just a food issue, but it's, um, it's alcohol. Um, you know, can a Christian drink, not drink? I mean, we're, that's an issue that Christians disagree on. What about, what about clothing? What about um, the way that we dress? You know, what, what, what do you consider to be modest or not modest? I mean, Christians disagree on that. What about what we watch on television, what we set in front of our eyes for entertainment? I mean, we have various opinions about what constitutes what's acceptable and, and not acceptable. And so, again, these are issues on which uh, Bible-believing, you know, spirit-controlled Christians disagree. So what do we do when we have these issues? Paul's going to tell us uh, and give us some insight. So um, let's go ahead and delve into chapter 14. We'll read verses 1 through 4. Paul says this, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions, or not to fight about your opinion. But Paul says one person, may, uh, one person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. So again, the issue of eating meat that had been potentially sacrificed to idols. Paul phrases it in an interesting way. He says, that this is um, an issue between a weaker believer and a stronger believer. And, and quite probably to our amazement, um, the one that Paul phrases is the weaker believer is the one who has more rules set up for themselves. And so quite honestly, I think that kind of contradicts our thinking. Usually we think of a stronger believer as a more separate believer, one who has more distinction between them in the world, and that's not how Paul phrases it here. He says the, the weaker believer is the one with the weaker, the weaker conscience uh, in, this, in this area. And so this person, the weaker, the weaker brother, uh, sets up rules to kind of create a wider berth. Okay, they're more uh, conservative, I guess if I could use that word, in their choices because they, they don't want to approach, and, and rightfully so, they don't want to put themselves in a situation where they're damaging their fellowship with God, okay? So the, the weaker Christian is going to set up more rules, um, create a wider berth. And so um, and some, sometimes we, we refer to that, that type of a, 
of a believer, a brother or sister, as a, as a legalist, one who, who tends to, to create more rules for themselves. And it's, and it's out of a, a pure intention, um, but, but yet does create some, uh, some issues. Uh, Paul says the stronger believer, or the stronger Christian, um, is the one who does not, doesn't need the rules, um, and it's not that they're not controlled by something. They, they very much have a guiding principle, but that principle is the Holy Spirit. The Holy, it's, we're talking about a believer who, a strong Christian is a believer who is spirit-controlled, uh, who, who is walking wisely in obedience with the Holy Spirit and Scripture, because those two work together, right? The Holy Spirit, as He has taken up residence in the believer, He reminds us of the things that the Scripture teaches he gives us application of those things, and when we, when we walk in, in coordination and in harmony with that spirit, God says he, he puts his law in our, in our hearts, and so we can actually follow him by following the Holy Spirit. Uh, but at any rate, uh, and that's something we're going to talk more about in our summer CT study, if that's something interesting to you. We'll talk more about uh, what we call legalism and, and some of those terms. Um, but... Uh, Anyway, the, so we're talking primarily about this distinction between weaker and stronger believers. Now, notice here that who he's not talking to, he's not talking to unbelievers. Okay, this is it's written to believers. It's written to people who are interested in walking with the Lord. Um, and so that's, the, that's the, sort of the framework here. And, and so notice the, the commands to, these, to the weak and the stronger brothers. Um, he says to the weaker, um, not to judge not to judge. So the one who has more rules, um, who, who, who sort of needs that extra buffer zone between them and offending God, says that, that particular brother, he says to that person, he says, don't judge the, the, the other. He says, don't, don't condemn them. And you could sort of see that. Think about some of the things that we've mentioned today. You know, we've talked about, um, talked about alcohol. We've talked about choices in entertainment, choices in dress, and things like that. You know, we have some who accept less, some who accept more, but if they're, if they're walking with the Lord in those areas, um, so, you know, what do we do? He says to the weaker, don't judge your brother who has more freedom in the Spirit. Um, and he says to the stronger, he says, now, the tendency for you would be to despise the one who accepts less, the weaker. The tendency there is to despise or to look down on. And you could, I mean, I'm sure you've seen that in, at at play uh, in relationships within the church. So we've got the weaker and the stronger Christian who will tend to despise and tend to judge each other. Um, and, and the goal here is to not create separation. What does, what does Paul say? He says, welcome him. The weaker brother, welcome him. And then, a, and, and then down underneath that, what, you know, why, why do we welcome him? Because God has welcomed him. God accepts the weaker brother just like he does the stronger. And he doesn't want there to be division in our fellowship over these, uh, what we're going to call gray areas. So, um, as Paul continues, he says that, uh, he said, who are you to pass judgment on the servant, of, on this servant? So notice, who, who are we talking about here? We're talking about servants of God. These are folks, again, who are interested in walking with the Lord. Uh, we're not talking about uh, the world. We're not talking about unbelievers. We're not talking about carnal Christians. No, we're talking about people who are genuinely uh, walking with uh, the Lord here, servants of the Lord. Um, but Paul goes on in verse 5 through 12. Now he addresses a, a, another subject, which is interesting. Uh, and he talks about celebrating certain days. Now think today about the division that we have even in the Christian community about how we celebrate days or don't celebrate days. I mean, what do we do with Christmas? What do we do with Halloween? What do we do with Easter? What do we do with birthdays and, and so forth and so on? Now, I'm convinced if you had 12 Christians in a room to discuss this topic, you'd easily come up with 20 opinions. Okay? It would be very easy for them to disagree even among themselves. Um, but Paul gives us some great advice in this. He says he said this. He said, one person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. And I love this. He said, each one should be what? Fully convinced in his own mind. Each should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, 
abstains in honor of the Lord since he gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account to God. So a couple of things about that passage that stood out to me. First is the the command for each of us to be fully convinced in our own mind. You see, as we'll read in just a minute, whatever does not proceed from faith, the scripture says, is, is sin. So what that means is we, we need to be fully convinced. Whether it's, and, and it's, I'm not just talking about Christmas and Easter and all these things. It could just be Tuesday, just a regular old middle of the week day. How do we steward that? I mean, what do we do with the time that God has given us? I mean, what do we do with that? How do we manage it? Are we managing it in a way that we feel confident before the Lord he's pleased with? And, and furthermore, not just our time, not just the days that he's given us, but the resources that he's given us, the relationships he's given us. Scripture's clear here that, that each of us will give an account to God for how we use everything that he's given us. And everything we have, he has given us. As, uh, as we read a couple weeks ago, remember, for from, from him and through him and to him are all things. So everything is from the Lord. Everything belongs to him. The breath that we have, the days he gives us, the resources he gives us, uh, the family he gives us, the, the, the opportunities he gives us, we're, he's expecting us to steward the things he's given us and to do it with, with a clear conscience. And, that, and that's something we'll talk about in a minute. We need to be fully convinced in our own mind that we're doing it in a way that honors the Lord. So it requires us to stop and to reflect. Is this the way that God would have me manage this or steward this opportunity? Um, and so it's something we need to ask ourselves. So again, that's uh, from situation to situation, that's going to be different. But each of us need to be convinced uh, in our own mind. Uh, and, and verse 12, it says, each of us will give an account to God. Now that's kind of scary when you think about that, that we will give an account to God for how we manage things. Um, scripture says that we'll give an account for every word that we speak. Now that's, that's kind of scary. But I just want to encourage you with this. I mean, the Bible talks a lot about judgment, but remember the, the therefores in the book of Romans? There is, for believer in Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation. This is not talking about a judgment of condemnation. It's actually talking about something different. And the idea that's in, that's in play here in verse 12 is that we're going to be given account to God uh, and we'll be judged, but it's, uh, it's referring to the Bema Seat judgment, and which is a little different. In those days, they had, when they had an athletic contest, whether it was a race or some type of a, an event, there was a, a place called the Bema Seat where the judges uh, or the officials would stand, and at the end of the event, they would hand out awards. They would put wreaths on the heads of those who had run the race and run it well, and they had finished well. And they also would look from that vantage point of the Bema seat, and they would look and they would watch to see if those runners or participants disqualified themselves in any way. And so that was the, what is in view here when it talks about us as believers giving account to God for the things he's given us. It's for the purpose of reward. It's for the purpose of him saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. He, he desires that for us, but this judgment that he's talking about, it's, again, it goes back to that imagery of a race. We're running a race, we're running it together, and are we disqualifying ourselves by the things that we allow in our lives, by the way that we steward the things he's given us? Do we disqualify ourselves? And so, um, as we go on at verse uh, 13, it says, Let us therefore not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. I'm, I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, 
but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. So with this idea of stumbling blocks and hindrances, uh, I was thinking about this earlier. Uh, uh, sometimes I play Mario Kart. You ever play Mario Kart? With the, you know, on the Wii or whatever. I mean, it's been around for years, but if you've never played it, you know, you're racing a go-kart around the track and you got your controller and you're, you know, you're in a race. And every once in a while, you know, you come across the, you ever see the banana peels on the track? You hit that banana peel and <laughs> you spin out and you're into the wall. And you have to, it, it slows you down. You got to start over. Okay. And you got to get back on the track and start running. And, and so you've got things like that. They're obstacles. But then you've got other obstacles like that you can put in someone else's path. Uh, there's one, uh, it's like an ink blot or something. You press the button and it, it squirts ink on other people's windshields. And they can't see where they're going. It like blocks out the important part of the screen and you can't see and you, and you wreck. Okay, I'm thinking about that when I'm reading this. This is a race that we're in. We're in this Christian race together. And it's not just about me finishing first. That's not what it's about. It's about us all collectively finishing well. And we're to help each other along the way. Not spin each other out and get us into the wall. That's not the goal here. You know, we're in this thing together. And, as, and, and sometimes we get really single focused that it's just, oh, it's just me and God. No, it's me and God and everybody else together. And that's what makes it difficult. Like if I, if I do something stupid, like imagine that we're all riding in a boat together. Okay, and, and, and we're riding this boat together, and I say, well, I'm going to drill a hole under my seat. Well, it's fine for me because it's my seat. I mean, I get to drill a hole under it if I want to. Right? Does that, do you see the point? I mean, we're all in this ride together, and, and if I do something stupid, it doesn't just affect me. It affects all of us. And so that's whether that's in our family, whether that's in our, our church family. You know, we need to, to not put those things um, in the way as, as obstacles or hindrances to other believers. Uh, so there's, there's a lot we could say about, uh, about stumbling blocks. Paul goes on and says in verse 17, he um, says, The kingdom of God is, is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what it's about. He said, Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. And, and that's interesting. The kingdom of God is not about finishing first. So it's not just about me. Um, it's about us all. But it's the kingdom of God. It says it's not about, it's, um, it's, it's not about um, what you might would call, how could we summarize that? Bodily appetites. Okay? It's not about pursuing bodily appetites, but it's about pursuing something else. Righteousness, peace, joy, and, um, and I think it looks like what Jesus looked like. It says that um, in uh, verse 18, whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. Think about how Jesus lived his life. There's a verse in Luke that says that as Jesus was growing up, you know, as a youngster, it says he, he grew in wisdom and in stature with, with God and with man. And so think how Jesus lived his life. I mean, Jesus lived in a way that, that he lived to please the Father, but, but it says he also grew in wisdom and stature with, with, with man also. Now, that doesn't mean they just loved him and everything he did was great. I mean, there were people that, that killed Jesus. I mean, they desperately hated him. But the thing that they did not have was they did not have a handle on his life. Nothing that they could condemn him for legitimately. Jesus was without sin. That's how he wants us to, to live this Christian life. He doesn't want us to have a handle, something that people can grab onto and, and, and disqualify us with. And so that's the goal. He says, whoever thus serves Christ, whoever in this way serves Christ, it says, is acceptable to God and approved by men, meaning they can't condemn you for the way that you live. So um, as we continue, Paul says um, in verse 20, do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything indeed is clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes 
your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep it between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, for the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So as we look at that, um, if everywhere, he, everywhere that, that he just wrote the word eat, okay, you could substitute some other questionable area that we have in our Christian life. Substitute something else. Wherever it says eat meat. Um, to back to what we talked about earlier, our, uh, what we do with alcohol, what we do with entertainment, what we do with the way we dress, what we do with the places we go. Do we cause, like, like the ink blots we talked about, do we, do we cause those things in the lives of other people who are running the race with us? Do, do we throw out things like that to trip them up? Um, and, if we, and if we do, it's clear that we have to answer to God for those things. And so um, lots of things, I mean, we could consider there. Um, and I don't know if God's got one in particular maybe he's speaking to you about, but I'll just throw one out there, but I'll just throw out um, alcohol as an example. Uh, you know, a lot of Christians feel that a moderate amount of alcohol is acceptable. And, um, and I won't argue with that. But uh, what does the scripture say? It says, do not be filled with wine, wherein is debauchery or dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. But think, so, so <laughs> drunkenness is not even a, that's not even an issue. The scripture has already dealt with that. But a, a moderate amount, let's think about that. Can that, I'm not saying it will, but can that be a roadblock in our fellowship together? Can that be a, a stumbling block? Um, you know, I think about folks that, um, you know, they have a tendency towards alcoholism. I would hate to be the one to kind of nudge them down that road. You know, just thinking that, well, uh, and, and, and putting the blame on them. Just like, well, you know, they should be able to, what's the word? They should be able to have some self-control, right? I mean, do I want to be the one that kind of introduces them to that and gets them kick-started down that road that leads to alcoholism, poor choices? I mean, the very nature of alcohol is it, it, it makes you make poor choices. I mean, do I want to start somebody down that road? You know, it, it can be dangerous. Uh, another thing that I don't think we think about, and whether it's alcohol or some other issue, um, that Paul, Paul just wrote, he said, if, if, if we encourage some, to somebody to do something that they believe in their heart is wrong, for that person, it's, it's wrong because it, it hinders their fellowship. So just as an example, I mean, if, if we're with a believer who truly in their heart feels like that alcohol is, is wrong no matter what, you know, if through our words or peer pressure we, inv we, we, we put pressure on that person to do something and it violates their conscience between them and God, well, guess what happened to their relationship? Okay, it's not, it's not what it was. Okay, and they, they, their, con their conscience has been violated before, before God and, and we, don't, we don't, again, we don't want to be participating uh, in that. So all I'm saying is be, be, be mindful, be careful, be thoughtful. Paul says we need to be convinced that what we're doing is, is, um, is, um, is between us and God, we need to be convinced in our own mind that it's acceptable uh, to him because only we will have to answer uh, for our own selves. Um, but as we, um, and I know we're kind of running out of time here, but as we kind of get ready to wrap this up, a few things that I'll share with you uh, just by way of um, conclusion. Um, so we've talked about stumbling. We've talked about, uh, and I love this verse, uh, it talks about keeping the faith you have between yourself and God. Look at um, 22. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Uh, and I've read that verse, and my first reading of that, I thought, you know what? That means it's like, like it's some kind of secret. Like, keep it between you and God. Like we say, oh, just keep this between me and you. And that's not, I don't think, what that means. It doesn't mean that our faith is a private thing. It means that we should keep it. We should protect it. Like, if we're if we do things that, whatever it is, violate what we feel that, that God wants us to do, it, it creates a separation. And, and whatever that is, it doesn't matter if it's something with food, with drink, with dress, with entertainment, with you know, anything. You know, Paul says, the faith that you have, the things that you accept or reject, keep, keep that. Keep that holy. Keep that, keep that intact between you and God. 
So whatever you, whatever you decide in each of these gray areas, Paul says, make up your mind. Make up your mind. Be fully convinced and then keep it. Don't, don't trample on it. If, if you've made that decision, then you need to stick with it. And so um, keep the faith that you have between yourself and God. Um, and so as we conclude this morning, I just want to share a couple of thoughts with you here. Uh, I said we were going to come up with more questions than we probably had answers. <laughs> so I'm going to share some questions with you. Um, so in the, with the aspect of, of, of what we've talked about this morning, um, it, could, it could be time. <laughs> it could be time for some spring cleaning. Um, and so I'm just going to say spring cleaning needs to start at home. So in my life, uh, this is probably some of the questions I need to be asking myself. Uh, number one, how do I filter what do I accept in my life? Um, a lot of times we don't have a good filtration system. Um, what do I choose? And all the things I just talked about, all the gray areas. I mean, how do I choose what I watch on TV? Uh, how do I choose what I put into my body? How do I choose what I wear? How do I choose uh, where I go? Um, how do I choose what activities I pursue? How do I choose those things and how do I decide? Well, that's a good question to ask. How do I filter that? And Scripture's clear, we need, to, need to have a, we need to have a filtration system. So we need to walk with the Lord. I think there's no substitute for being in the book. Uh, when we're in here and the Holy Spirit teaches us the principles, we're a lot better equipped than just trying to copy somebody that we see. Okay, We're better equipped when we allow His Holy Spirit to reveal His Word. We can make better decisions on what we filter, um, the things that we accept. So again, spring cleaning, how do I filter what I accept into my life? Um, uh, number two, I mean, am I doing something today that I hate myself for? Because I, we've all been there. I mean, there have been things that I allow in my life that, quite frankly, when I'm done, it lets me down. I realize that, you know what, I accepted something that I should not have accepted. And it, um, and it was sin. So what do I do about that? Well, for a believer, God says, we can clean house. We can start right now. First John 1 John 1.9 says, that if we, as believers, will confess our sin, just confess to him. He's already forgiven you, but he says if you will confess, it says God is faithful and just and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Just like, just like Jesus washed the disciples' feet, he says you're already clean, but you need me to wash your feet. Same thing goes with a believer. If we've allowed something in our life that it was just a poor choice and it's sin, God says confess it to me. I'm faithful, and I'll ju I'm just, and I'll forgive you. Hebrews chapter 10 is a beautiful picture there. It says, as we draw near to God because of Jesus and what he's done for us, it says, as we draw near to God, there's this picture that he washes us. He, it's like he washes our body, and, and not only our body, but it says he even sprinkles or kind of cleans our, our conscience. It says having our evil conscience or our dirty conscience, he even, he even sprinkles that. He even cleanses our conscience. And, uh, and the conscience is a useful tool. I mean, God has put that in us for a reason. Uh, it's a warning system. And when we violate it, I mean, it, it has consequences. It's like ignoring the check engine light on your car. You know, you don't want to do that for very long. Um, but again, is there, are we doing something today that we hate ourselves for? Have we allowed something we shouldn't have allowed? And what do we do about that? And then, again, not just... Um, about myself and my relationship to God, but also the way that I relate to others um, horizontally is important as well. Um, and as we talked about stumbling blocks today and hindrances, uh, do I allow fellowship to be hindered because of my take on these questionable areas? I mean, that verses one through four where we talked about the weaker and the stronger and the despising and the judging, I mean, do you, do you see any of that operating right now? I mean, maybe it's in the um, maybe it's in this this room today. I don't know, uh, but if but if that's if that's if that's you, you see that. Remember what he says: don't despise, don't judge, because God has accepted this other believer. Um, and again, as we talked about stumbling blocks, is there any liberty that I'm taking that's hindering someone else's spiritual growth? You know, sometimes the things that we accept in our lives aren't bad. I mean, we think about our like hobbies, for instance. You know, they're not bad. I mean, we all have things that we like to do, and they're not sinful, per se, but sometimes do those things need to take a back seat so that something better can take their place? I mean, I think about our fellowship time together. I mean, sometimes, um, 
you know, I might be doing things that aren't necessarily bad, but, um, but they occupy the place that something better could have. So, um, anyway, it's just something to think about. So, as we, I know we're out of time this morning. What I'd like to do is just have everyone, uh, let's go ahead and stand. We'll have a word of prayer, and then I think we'll just go ahead and dismiss this morning. So, um, as we just take a moment, just kind of reflect on Romans chapter 14, this idea of gray areas. Uh, there may be something that God is asking you to do with that, or he's asking me to do with that. Uh, and I pray that we would um, we'd take that seriously. Uh, let's pause for a moment for a word of prayer. Lord, we do thank you this morning for your word. Thank you that you give us principles. Uh, you give us wisdom. You give us guidance. And Lord, you have instilled in us your Holy Spirit to direct us down these paths. And we've, um, we want to run this race. We want to run it well. We don't want to be disqualified. Father, thank you for the the lengths that you've gone to to just protect us. Um, we thank you for, um, for your Holy Spirit that convicts us. We thank you for your people who admonish us, who encourage us along the race. Father, we just thank you for all that you do for us on our behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. On behalf of Grace Bible Church, we'd like to say we appreciate you listening in, and we pray that it has been an encouragement to you. For more information on Grace Bible Church, please visit us at gracebiblerockwell.com. Or, if you're in the area, we'd love to have you stop by and visit us. Thanks again for listening in today. 